In the name of the one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a story that I once read of an old parish priest who lived and worked and ministered deep in the forest of Bavaria in southern Germany. We are talking the land of pine forests and lederhosen and good beer, the Oktoberfest and all that. And this priest stood up to deliver a sermon on Trinity Sunday, just as I am doing now. And he began thus. The doctrine of the holy and undivided Trinity is indeed the great and ineffable mystery at the heart of the Christian faith. It's so great, it's so ineffable, that I don't really understand anything about it. So let's sing the next hymn. Now, it's tempting for every preacher to do that sort of thing this morning. And of course, it is often the case that curates and new clergy um, look forward with great anticipation to their first ever Trinity Sunday sermon. And as I think about that old Bavarian priest, in a sense, he wasn't far wrong because he had the right approach to mystery. The appropriate response to mystery is silence and worship and contemplation. So he had a, a sound instinct, an instinct that has reverberations down through the church's great rich history and tradition. The famous English medieval mystic Thomas Akempis, who is well known for his famous imitation of Christ, said this, what will it avail thee to dispute profoundly of the Trinity if thou be void of humility and art thereby displeasing to the Trinity? And that instinct for reverence and silence and worship before mystery goes back way beyond Thomas Akempis, way back into the earliest parts of the Old Testament. Think for a moment, if you will, of Moses at the burning bush. He encounters God in the fire that burns that doesn't consume the bush. And he says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am, say I am sent you. And so in the Hebrew religion, the name of God is paradoxically at once both a revelation and also a concealment. God speaks to mankind without in any way diminishing his mystery and his ineffable nature. And so to understand something of what the church means by the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, we just have to look back in history, the history of the early church and further back um, into the New Testament and even to the old. Now, of course, the first Christians were monotheists in contrast to uh, all the other nations, the Jewish and then the Christian faith professed belief in one God. There was no time for polytheism or pantheism. There is one God who is transcendent and mysterious and who has deigned to be with mankind, dwelling with his people in the temple, in the law and in wisdom. And in the text of the Old Testament, the church fathers saw something of the hidden nature of the Trinity. For in the way God is spoken of, there is a recognition that even the concept of oneness, of unity, cannot adequately describe God. And in the Hebrew language, we have a thing called the plural of majesty. Think back to the book of Genesis. And now God says, let us make man in our image. The early fathers saw in such language and in many other ways a foreshadowing of what was to be revealed in Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, we find passages where God's wisdom, God's spirit, God's breath, God's word are spoken of poetically in personal and agential terms. My word shall not return to me empty. 
But it is the encounter of the first Christians, of the apostles and the early church with Jesus that opens up to us the worship of the Trinity. Those who first followed Jesus came to see in him far more than a man, far more than a prophet, far more than an envoy, the very presence of God in human flesh. This truth, which is hinted at in his earthly life, is shown once and for all in the resurrection. And in today's gospel reading, he gives them that great commission to go out and to teach and to baptise in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we were to sum up the religious experience, the personal experience, the prayer experience of the earliest Christians, we would say that here are a people who were schooled for centuries in the monotheistic faith of the Jews and yet are driven by the sheer power of experience, the experience of Jesus as the risen Son, and the experience of the Spirit as an enabling presence in the church to speak in terms which later generations would call Trinitarian. They don't even realise they're doing it quite a lot of the time. That is their experience of God. They know God not now as a distant figure, but as a loving father through the sonship of Jesus and the abiding presence of the Spirit in their community. In our second reading, which Lindy read, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you might say in summary that in the New Testament there is an irreducibly threefold aspect to the communities and individuals' experience of God. It, of course, took several more centuries for the church to fully come to terms with this mystery and put it into words of doctrinal formulation. And, of course, the Nicene Creed, which we shall say in a moment, simply presents before us the persons of the Trinity, the summation of all that God has revealed in Scripture and in the life of the Church. So, in a sense, they're driven by experience to speak in these ways. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard and experienced and felt. And it is in the second century that the, the uh, theologian Tertullian first uses the word trinity. And what we must understand is that this is not some kind of heavenly riddle. It's not some kind of metaphysical mind puzzle. You often hear in Trinity Sunday sermons all sorts of allusions and analogies, uh, shamrocks, three-in-one toothpaste, different parts of an elephant feeling differently. I think that there are values in such way of speaking, but also arguably many of them are heretical, so I shan't be using lots of analogies. What I do want to say is that the doctrine of the Trinity seeks to preserve and to communicate to subsequent generations that uniquely Christian experience of God. A God who is not distant, a God who is not a tyrant, and a God who speaks to us of love and relationship. For in the Trinity, there is communion and fellowship and sharing. There is love at the heart of reality. Now, I want to give you all a little practical exercise. It's probably been a long time since you've dusted off your Book of Common Prayer with the way we use newer service books now. But in the Book of Common Prayer is a vital uh, statement of faith called the Athanasian Creed. You can find it after evening prayer in the prayer book. And it says, whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost. And so it goes on. It's, it's repetitive and you really will, once you have read this, or much more importantly, prayed it, 
understand what is meant by the Trinity. It doesn't explain, but it gives us a way in. Because the Trinity is not a thing to be understood, but a reality to be experienced and entered into. And the way through that is a mystical path, the way of prayer. And as we contemplate more deeply the mystery of the triune God, we realise many truths. And one in particular spoke to me this week from the old Athanasian Creed that I do want you to go and read. And in this Trinity is none afore or after or, or greater than another. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-equal together and co-eternal. And there is a, oh, another old parish priest, this time in the east end of London, had that phrase, which, sorry, I just misread, but the whole three persons are co-equal together and co-equal, co-eternal. As, as in the Holy Trinity, so in this parish. The communion, the sharing, the equality, the relationship at the heart of God is a communion, a sharing, an equality that we are called to preach and live out in a world where tyranny, where hierarchy, where racism and prejudice and discrimination are often the way forward. The way to being able to speak authentically of that reality is through the mystical path. Doctrine and experience are not opposed, they go together. C.S. Lewis once told a story of a retired arm, of a army officer who said to Lewis, I have no reason to need all your dogma and ritual and all that sort of thing, for I had an experience of God in the Arabian desert, and that experience was very real to me. And Lewis turned that around, he said, well, Think of the desert. If you are in the desert, you will know that the desert itself cannot be substituted. A map is no substitute for the reality of the place that it describes. But if you are in that place without a map, it can be a dangerous, confusing and bewildering place. And that's the right understanding of our doctrines, our creeds, our formularies. They are maps that help us walk on the way, that keep us in the path. We may never in this life fully understand the doctrine of the Trinity, but through our prayers, through our sacraments, through our membership of the church, we partake in the very life of the Holy Trinity the God in whom we live and move and have our being. To the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, be glory both now and forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.